Malachi chapter number 1. We're not going to start reading here, but i got to get you all a summary of what happens in chapter number 1 so that we can get to chapter number 2. Okay, now Malachi, prophet, burdened of God to pen this letter. And the letter's to all of Israel, but he spends a lot of time dealing with the Levites. Okay, now the Levites, under the Mosaic Law, okay, God chose the Levites, well, Levi and his descendants, to be ministers and priests in the house of God. Okay, even if you weren't a, you know, high priest or had a position within the temple, all Levites had a role. Okay, some of them, they went around and they cleaned the altars right after they'd had burnt sacrifices burned on them. Other ones made sure that cleaning the house of God, making sure that everything was in order. Right, it was somebody's job to make sure that there was always oil in what nowadays we'd call a menorah, right, because it was God's word that the light should never go out in the house of God. It was some's job to do a little bit of breaking because we know that they had showbread on the table. Some of them, they were to burn incense. Okay, some were ministers of music. It was their job to know how to play their musical instrument the best that they could so that they could give the most honor and glory unto God. Some were psalmists. They wrote songs of praise and worship unto God. Even David, when he wrote them, where did he send them most of the time? To the priest. So that the priest could arrange it to music. Right? So, the Levites, being the priests, okay, verse number 6, God tells all of Israel, a son honoreth his father and his servant his master. If I then be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? O saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name, and ye say, Wherewith or wherein have we despised thy name? In other words, God's saying, if you all honor your earthly fathers and your earthly masters, where is the honor due God and where is the fear or the reverence due God's name? You go on to find in these next couple of verses, they say, where have we despised thy name? What have we done to not show God what was due him? You find out they were offering sacrifices that weren't the best that people had to offer for burnt offerings. God instructed that the best was to be given. Right? That's a sign of faith that we believe that if we gave our best that God would be able to provide for us. But yet you find that they're offering up animals that are blind, that have diseases, that are lame. Ones that if you'd have cooked it and put it in front of somebody for dinner, they'd have looked at you and said, no, thank you. Right? We don't want that, but yet God says, you wouldn't serve it to somebody else, but yet you give it unto me as your best. Okay, then he goes on to say, verse number 10, right? Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do ye kindle fire upon mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. He says, used to, the Levites served with joy. They served out of respect. And they did it out of love for the very God of glory. Yet he says, now there's not one of them that would hold the doors open without wanting something in return. Wouldn't even open up the temple so that people could come in and worship unless there was something in it for them. Then he goes on to say, right, not only just hold open the doors, right, look again, verse number 10, kindle a fire on the altar. They would say, well, where's my portion? Granted, under the law, there was a part of the animal that was supposed to go to the Levites. Right, that was their payment for administering and doing what God would want them to do. But here it's saying that they're wanting more than what God said they needed. No words to say that the Levites got something for holding the doors open. Nor did it say that they got part of an offering because they were the ones who ministered their offering. No, they received because God always has a way to provide for those that are faithful for Him. 
Truth is, they didn't want to do what they were doing. They just wanted the position, the title. That they wanted people to look at them and see something impressive, but they didn't want to do nothing. You know, reminds me of a whole lot of politicians nowadays. That always talking, but they won't do anything unless there's something in it for them. It's the exact opposite of what they're supposed to do. But why did the Levites do it? Because they didn't honor the name of God and they didn't fear the name of God. But they had convinced themselves that they did. Because every time God brings up something, He always has Malachi write down the question, but ye say, wherein have we not honored it? Wherein have we given you know, offerings that despise the altar of God? And it goes on, they keep saying, well, how have we done it? Haven't we kept all of the rituals and ordinance? He says, you've kept the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. He says, you do according to what you've been taught, but what you've been taught has lost all of its emotion, all of its meaning, all the purpose behind it. The law was not there to condemn people. The law was there to show us that we were sinners. The law was not given to damn people to hell. People were damned already to hell. The law was given to show us that we weren't right, but that God would make a way for us. In the Old Testament, it was through the offerings. Right? New Testament, the perfect lamb came. Now he starts talking about that in chapter number 2. But the point is, okay, verse number 14, But cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male and valeth and sacrifice unto the Lord a corrupt thing. In other words, if they had a male of the first year, a lamb, that was the best that they had, if they offered anything else up, he says they're cursed. Why? Because halfway through verse number 14 for I am a great king saith the Lord of hosts and my name is dreadful among the heathen in other words he's saying the heathen those that don't know who God is that's what heathen means that they don't worship the true God yet here he says my name is dreadful even the heathen who don't know anything about him fear the name of almighty Jehovah he says but yet my people don't fear it enough don't reverence it enough that they would even offer their best. Then we get into chapter number 2. He says, And now, O ye priests, again the Levites, chapter number 2, Malachi, brother Bobby, O now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I will give them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. Here at the very end, verse number 6. Why did God choose Levi and his descendants to be the ministers and the priests of the house of God? Because of the fear and the reverence that Levi showed towards God. Levi wasn't chosen because he was the most honorable. Wasn't chosen because he was the most intelligent. Wasn't chosen because he was the best butcher in town and he could handle the sacrifices. No, Levi and the covenant that God made with his people was because Levi feared God and reverenced God more than anybody else. He took God as serious as God could be taken. When he heard the commandments of God, he didn't treat it as an instruction. As the, I'll say this. I bought something the other day. I was standing there waiting on it. Some guy walked up and he said, did this come with instructions in the box? I didn't see them when I got home. And the guy said, you don't need instructions. They're recommendations anyway. That's how we treat instruction manuals nowadays. I'll figure it out. If I need it, I'll go back to it. That's how people treat God nowadays. I've got, if I need help, then we'll go back. In. No, Levi considered it life or death. He's going to do what God said or literally die trying. Now that's somebody that you would want responsible for giving honor and glory under the name of God at the house of God, right? 
That's somebody that you say, well, there's a job that needs to be taken serious. What is it? Giving God the honor and glory to His name. Well, see, here's the other side of the story. Go to the book of Revelation. Don't, you don't have to turn there. But if you go to the book of Revelation, read the first couple of chapters. What did Jesus ordain you when He saved you? A king and a priest. You know that means it? In the New Testament, the believer, not just a believer, all believers, have been made priest to do what? One, to pray. We find that out in, over there in Revelation that we can enter directly into the throne room of God. I don't have to pray through somebody else. I, as a priest, can pray, and if anybody does intercede for me, who is it? The high priest, which is also God. Jesus being made our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So either way, guess who I'm praying to? God. But see, with the privilege of being able to talk with God come the responsibilities of being a priest. If the Levites didn't praise God, who's going to do it? All were commanded to, but these were the guys that is their job. They devoted themselves, said, Lord, my life is yours. I'll serve at your house. So if the Levites wouldn't open up the doors of God's temple for naught, you think that they're praising God like He deserved to be praised? Well, see, we as priests, who's supposed to praise God? We are. In fact, hang on. I just remembered. Look at down here. Yeah, I mean, he already said that his name was dreadful among the heathen. Right? Ver chapter number 3. Okay? Verse number 1, he talks about, Behold, I will send a messenger, and he shall pre prepare my way before me. You know, you know who that is? That's John the Baptist. Okay? Then it goes on saying about how the way will be prepared before the Lord. Then, okay, he goes on to say that He's going to give them another change. Verse number 6, he says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. He says, The only reason y'all still around is because I'm long-suffering and I'm merciful and I honor my promises. He says, If I wasn't God, y'all be dead already. Okay, but, verse number 8, I mean, then we get into what Dad quoted before service got over, right? Bring your first fruits into the house of God. But, he goes on to start talking about how if God's people didn't worship him and honor him that his name would become great among the heathen among the Gentile you know who that is? that's us he said if God's people don't God will find somebody to there are many over in the book of, if we don't praise him the rocks will cry out in our place all creation cries glory and honor unto God except for man man was given a choice the Bible says we're without excuse not to look around even before we got saved even in our carnal self to look around and see all that was made and know that there's a God and that he deserves to be praised yet how much more after we get saved he's made us priests Look back, check, check number two. He says, verse number two, if you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart, what, what's he telling them to pay attention to? What's he telling them to lay to heart? The warning that he just gave them in chapter number one. That they're supposed to take the things of God seriously and they're supposed to devote themselves to it wholly. Do things the way that God would do it. Okay. Then, verse number 3, he says, Behold, I will corrupt your seed, spread dung. In other words, I'd make a mockery of the religious crowd. What do you think Jesus did when he showed up? He didn't just call them a generation of the vipers. He proved that they were a generation of vipers. He didn't just show up and, you know, play all nice with the... No, he, he met a whole lot of them real angry. Why? Because he exposed that they weren't following after the way of the Lord. 
Where do you think that all started with? It started with the priests losing their position. There weren't Pharisees and Sadducees and a whole bunch of different sects at this time. You know what there were? There were priests. There were the Levites. You don't find Levites anymore when you come back over into the New Testament. Why? They didn't do what they were supposed to do. God got rid of them. They were brought under subjugation so many times that eventually they said, we're going to do the best we can without the Levites. You can't even say that the Pharisees were... They, Apostle Paul said he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Yet he was a Pharisee. They weren't Levites. They weren't descendants of Levi or Aaron and his sons, which when Moses came along, Aaron was a Levite. It was a house of Levi. That's why he was made the high priest. God honored his promise all throughout it, but the promise was if you revered me, God would take care of you. If you were fearful, God would take care of the Levites. They were supposed to do it with joy and with praise and with honor. And yet they got to the point that they just didn't want to do it at all unless there was something in it for them. Sound familiar? Sounds like modern day Christianity. Right, but look with me. Down at verse number 5. My covenant was with him of life and peace. And I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me. And was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. Levi and his descendants, when they lived right, their very speech condemned the actions of others. They didn't have to tell others how they were wicked, how they were full of iniquity. Their very lives convicted people because they saw how serious the Levites took being pure and presentable and usable by God. Do you realize that every morning the Levites had to get up and wash themselves, wash their clothing in a certain way so that they could stand before God and minister in His house? If they didn't, one of the senior Levites probably would have smacked them upside the back of the head told them to go do it again and do it right. If the high priest were to do it with the offering that was given every year, he'd be dead. God would take his life when he went to go enter into the Holy of Holies if he didn't prepare himself and his clothing the right way. These guys took things serious. Then it goes on to say, truth, not just truth, the law of truth. I can tell you the truth, but there's only one truth that's going to help you. That's God's truth. That's the law of truth. Levi didn't give his own opinion on the things of God. What did he tell people? What God said. When he opened his mouth to offer counsel, was it the counsel of Levi? No, it was what God said. It was God's counsel. You know what this passage in verse number 6 tells us? One... Doesn't James tell us that the tongue being a little member controlleth the whole body? But yet if any man can master the tongue, he can master the whole flesh. That's not what Jordan says, what James wrote to the church in his epistle. Well, if the law of truth was in Levi's mouth, you know what that tells me? It means before he was indwelled by the Holy Ghost, because this is the Old Testament, in a time where the Holy Ghost didn't seal him, in a time that he was still one of, there was no new creation yet where Christ had started the work in Levi because Jesus had not only, he couldn't be saved yet. They were still under the Old Testament law. In a time where he didn't have all that we had, you know what I find? Levi didn't say what he would say. He had control over his tongue. His mouth was full of the Word of God. You know what that means? He reigned in his flesh too. Compelled it to do what God would have him to do. And you know what we was rewarded with? A covenant from God. A promise. Look at verse number 5. My covenant was with him of life and peace. You know what that sounds a whole lot like? Life and life more abundantly. 
that he came that we might have joy and peace. Did not Isaiah prophesy that his name was Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting, the Prince of Peace? I believe that Levi just got a little, little taste of what was to come because he feared God that much. God made Levi a covenant. No other descendant of Jacob got this covenant. This was for Levi and his descendants. This was icing on top of it. He's one of God's chosen people, but this was given on top of it. But because he took the things of God so seriously, God said, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. One just for you. Well, do you realize that the promises and the fulfillments that Christ gave to us when we got saved, so much better than any of the covenants in the Old Testament. We're made a joint heir with Christ. You know why we received that? Not because of us, but because of Him. Levi found merit in the eyes of God because of how seriously he took That's why he was rewarded. Yet we get all the richest choice blessings of God even though we don't deserve them. What did we have to do to be blessed except Christ? What did we have to do in order to become a joint heir with Him? Let Him do a work. And nowadays people think that living for Christ is just as easy as getting... Getting saved was really easy because He did all the work already. Living for Christ, that's a whole different story. That's a life of tribulation, travail, trials, hardness. You know what Levi said to that life? I'll take it so that God can get the honor and glory. If Levi had done all these things, that Levi's name would have been elevated among God's people, God wouldn't have made him the Levites. Wouldn't have made him a priest. Because it would have been all about Levi. Notice. Verse number. Five again, my covenant was with him for life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear with which he feared me, and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, iniquity was not found in his lips, and he walked with me in peace and equity. You know why God gave Levi the covenant that God gave him? Because he feared him and respect. He gave God the glory he was due with, but he walked with him in peace and equity that's a word a lot of people don't like nowadays you know what equity means you give what was supposed to be given you don't give more you don't give less equity is you give somebody due what is due them okay, nowadays everybody wants to talk about equality of outcome that everybody gets the same thing no matter what they did or how but that's not equity equity is is you get what you deserve what you've earned well you know what God says that God says Levi dealt with him in equity Levi gave God what God deserved now if we really start breaking that down start thinking about what's God deserve everything did Levi give God everything? Did Levi give him the praise and the you know the best worship and the, no, he was still in the sin cursed flesh like we are. God deserves all praise. Can one person give God all praise? No. I can't praise you for somebody else. Can't praise God for everybody in the room. I can only reverence and fear God for myself. But yet God said that Levi treated him with equity. What's that mean? Levi gave all that he could to God. Levi knew he couldn't worship for somebody else. Levi knew that he couldn't fear God for somebody else, but he did know that I can control how I deal with God. Notice he said he did it with peace. A lot of times the things of God conflict with those things in us. You know what Levi did? He always made the flesh compel so that he was with peace with the things of God. You ever come into the house of God worn within yourself on how your day went and everything? Levi didn't. 
Before Levi even thought about coming to the house of God, he reigned his flesh in at home. So that when he got to the house of God to deal with the things of God, he was at peace with God and his soul. Can we say that we do that every time we come in the doors of God? He dealt with equity. That means he sought out. Keep in mind, back in this day, they didn't have it so easy that in order to get money, they just got a direct deposit from their boss. Or a check was given to them. Right? No, if they wanted to give something, to the house, they either had to grow it, had to raise it, had to labor for it so that they could go out and have something precious and valuable to give to God. Right? The guy who grows wheat, he doesn't have lambs, so what's he got to do? He's got to sell some of that wheat to go out and buy a lamb. Right? They had to go and search out. That's why he said, bring your first fruits, the best. You know what that required? Levi had to go out. He had to search out all that he had looking for the best that God deserved. He didn't have it so easy that we just think we can get away with it if we give 10%. Well, he said bring a tithe and an offering, but we're not going to get on that. No, Levi didn't just tithe. Levi didn't just give 10%. He dealt with God in equity. Everything that he did for God, Levi sought out himself, sought out all that he had to make sure that what God was getting was the best. Again, can we say that? God doesn't want monuments and signs and things built with his name on it. You know what God wants? People to deal with him in equity. He wants a people that take him so seriously and revere him enough that they want to give him the honor that he's due and deal with him in equity. Equity means no deceit. Equity means that you're always upfront and honest. Equity means that you devote the right amount of time to it, you devote the right amount of effort to it, and you don't hold anything back that God is due. Well, what's God do? Our best. But notice what he said. He said, if you don't take the message to heart, what did he say back in verse number 2? He says, I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already because you do not lay it to heart. You know why a lot of Christians got problems nowadays? Because their blessings are cursed because they don't give God their best. Their whole life has been touched by God in a negative way. Is it because they weren't faithful? No. Is it because that they missed a church service? No. Is it because when they went out they didn't, you know, wear a sign on their chest that says, I'm a Christian? No. You know what it was? They didn't give God their best. So many Christians now just can't figure out. It's always best to do right by God. I wish I could come up with a better definition than your, but you know what your best is. I may not know what your best is. But you and God both know what your best is. And given anything other than best, you know what that results in? Our blessings being cursed. Our very lives become out of order because between me and God, things are out of order. Levi had peace, not because Levi was peaceful, but because God touched his life with peace. God touched everything in Levi's life with peace because, look at verse number 6 again, he walked with me in peace and equity. You want a peaceful life? Treat God peace, peaceably. He'll take care of the rest of it. Levi didn't live a peaceful life all around. God said, I gave him peace 
as a whole because he'd sought out peace with me. Are things at peace between you and God this morning? Because if it isn't, I guarantee you this, you're not going to have a peaceable life. But I can, straight from the Word of God, tell you that if you seek out peace with God, God will make things out here peaceful. As long as things here are peaceful with Him. And truly, if you have that peace that passes all understanding, it doesn't matter what's going on out here. I am at peace because I'm at peace with God. But then he said, Levi, because of the way that Levi lived, he did turn many away from iniquity. Levi took God so serious that other people saw him, and we've already mentioned, got convicted that they weren't that way. Truly, the reason that God elevated Levi and blessed him was as an example to everybody. You take the things of God seriously, God will bless you. But people that thought that Levi wasn't doing it the right way, his words and his walk. Did I not say that his lips were filled with the law of truth? And his works were of peace with God and in equity with God. I don't know if y'all remember. The Lord just reminded me of it. You remember when we talked about Solomon and King Queen Sheba? She brought all these gold and the wealth and everything, that she, all these spices, the best that she had to offer. Solomon wasn't impressed. He just kept looking at it and saying, well, that's nice. Yeah, that's nice. She's trying to buy the wisdom of Solomon, which really was the wisdom of God. I mean, he's saying, I just don't find anything there that's lovely or beautiful, desirous to have. But it says, I believe it's over in 2 Samuel, that when Sheba saw Solomon in the way that he walked up into the house of God, that's when she realized why Israel was great and why Solomon was great. Because when Solomon went into the house of God, you know how he dealt with God? In equity. He took off the kingly robes. He made himself humble. He went into the house of God not as the king of Israel, but as one that just wanted to worship and honor God the way that he deserved. You know why Solomon asked for wisdom? So that he could do right by God to God's people. To make sure that God's people had a leader that knew what God wanted and didn't want. That's why God blessed him with it. And everything else on top of it. Why? Because he dealt with God in equity. Lord, I want to do right by you. Give me the tool, which in that case was wisdom, in order to lead your people as you would want them to be led. And what happened? God elevated him. And because of Solomon's equity with God, until his old age when he lost his mind and started bowing down before false gods. But when Solomon dealt with equity with God, what happened? Is because of his walk, literally, as Solomon walked into the temple, a foreign monarch didn't know about God, looked at him and said, that's what makes that man special. Because how he deals with his God, that's where the secret is. It's not in Solomon's brain, it's in the God of Israel. Same thing happened with Levi. Can I let you in on a secret? Same thing happens today can happen but what's it take people deal with equity between them and God truly you know what revival is revival is to stir up our remembrance I mean we can he talks about it in this chapter don't you remember the times when things were right between God and Israel then don't you remember the times when things he says you want to know why things aren't great no more because our relationship ain't great no more he says, you want to know why Israel suffered hardship? Because there's been no equity. And again, what's equity mean? Give him what he deserves. Equity is you pay your employee the wage that they deserve, not the wage you can get away with paying them. Equity is that when you get pulled, truly, equity is if Christian were to pull you over and say, you know why I pulled you over? 
no officer I don't know why you pulled me over but I do know that I deserve to be pulled over for this 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 and this that's equity Yet how many of us come before God and say, Lord, before I can even worship you, I know I've got this wrong, this wrong, this wrong, this wrong. We need to get this made right. That's equity. So I ask the question, how many of us deal with God in equity? And how many deal with Him in shades of gray? Revival is to stir up our remembrance of our first love. But you know what the fruit of revival is? Equity. God gets what God deserves. And then we reap the benefits of what? Being associated with Him. That glorious Christian life, you really know what it is? Us being on good terms with God. Doesn't matter where I'm at as long as I've got a good relationship with God. You know what's required for that to happen? Just equity. You say, well, it's hard to rein the flesh in sometimes. I get that. But if you fear God and if you honor God enough in your heart, it's worth the effort. Why? Because that's what God deserves. It's equitable. You know why Levi was blessed? Levi wasn't special. That's what God goes to the point. What nothing special about Levi that causes him to get blessed? You know what caused Levi to get a special covenant? You know what caused him to have a life of peace? You know why that happened? Because he gave God what God deserved. There's no secret there. God's been doing that since the beginning. But he's saying the examples are so few that it's just Levi. I wonder today, if we could peel things back, see into heaven, wonder how many God would say today, that person deals with me in equity. goodness is if you want to know if things are good he'll show you but you've got to deal with him in equity you've got to come before him humble come before him low and say Lord show me the things that I don't know because if you ask and you seek you will find if you knock it's going to be open if you do it in the right spirit for the right reason do you struggle to find good Bible based resources to supplement your personal devotions if so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.